everything that you see, nobody made this except one of us, whether it be, you know, a bricklayer or, you know, a carpenter or whoever he may be or whatever he does, he built that suit that he's got on his back. It's the essence of South Philadelphia, made up of a million different neighborhoods. It's, it's the fancy division. All over the world, there were festivals when people gathered to celebrate. Using costume and disguise, they put aside everyday realities and take on new, strange identities. On New Year's Day, the Mummers Parade in Philadelphia is such an occasion. Each year since 1901, thousands of costume marchers from neighborhood clubs throughout the city parade up Broad Street to City Hall, where their displays and performances are judged by blue ribbon teams from the worlds of theater, art, and design. Many influences contribute to what the costumes look like today, including seasonal masking customs that have been blending in Philadelphia neighborhoods for several centuries. Symbols of luck and chance and European comic figures like the jester and clown were already popular in the local processions of 19th century Philadelphia. Modern mummers still draw upon these motifs and characters and continue to add new ones. The feathered hoop skirts of Caribbean Carnival have found their way to Broad Street, along with contemporary imagery from the movies in Broadway. Today there are four distinct divisions, each with its own style of expression. Satire and raucous humor are the comic stock in trade, while the string bands and brigades specialize in dazzling musical and thematic presentations that approach the glamour of Broadway shows. Inventive costuming and elaborate individual display is at the heart of what the fancies are about. With professional judges and increased television exposure, the parade has grown more competitive, and some divisions now use professional designers and choreographers. Everyone who goes up the street wears a costume, but some people still make their own suits from beginning to end. This folk tradition especially thrives in the fancy division. In warehouse clubs, family workshops, and neighborhood garages, people have devoted months of effort working out their ideas. I'd say to myself, I don't think this is going to work, but this is what I want. This is what's going to make it happen. So you forget it, you throw you know, caution to the wind, and you say, if it does work, this is a honey. Bobby Pandola of the Oregon Fancy Club is recognized both by his fellow mummers and the judges as an outstanding suit builder, known for the intricacy of his wirework frames. Bobby combines technical expertise with creative flair and a fondness for special effects, suits with moving parts, for example, or hidden water tanks to provide rain. Gimmicks, most definitely. <laughs> and there isn't many things that have never been done on Broad Street. So the key is, is to come up with that little niche that nobody else thought of or nobody knew how to do it. And you figure it out. After years of carrying suits himself, Bobby knows how to translate fanciful ideas into working realities that can meet the strains of a windy Philadelphia street. And there are the mechanics to this. Forget about the design, forget about what it looks like as a pretty, you know. So you gotta hap strike that happy medium that it's light enough to carry, strong enough to bend with the wind and not break and all these durability things. So there is the sheer mechanics that you gotta know that you have to build into these things. Bobby's thematic floats and lightweight back pieces are quite different from suits built by earlier fancies who prided themselves on shouldering huge heavy suits up the length of Broad Street. Years ago, the theory behind it is how big of a suit I can have on my back. Uh, they always thought that the bigger the suit, the bigger the prize. My dad was one of the first guys um, to ever put wheels on a frame suit. They used to carry these things. Bobby's father was among those who began to change the look of the parade after World War II. Innovators like Armin Pandola, Ralph Tercy, and Francis Palamides began to experiment, adding greater movement and a more theatrical kind of presentation. As they stretched their imaginations, they sometimes stretched the rules and conventions that had come to define the way suits were built. As soon as half of them suits, or we built, hit Broad Street, there was 30 guys standing around and saying, we're disqualifying, it's not a frame suit. Well, they never disqualified any of them. And then what happened? look on the streets and you see what happened is that everybody started to build them because you couldn't beat us for a while. Nowhere is the effect of individual innovations more striking than in the frame suit category, a type of suit unique to the fancy division. 
Since the early 1900s, all frame suits were built according to one traditional model. Variations were based on color combinations and geometric designs. Within the fancy division, within the frame suit category, it was strictly colors and shapes. These things have become many floats. It's going away from these flat head pieces to come away from that and bring you in the world of three dimensions. It's not just a front and a back, but it's actually a three-dimensional object. Some mummers still prefer the elegance of a well-crafted traditional suit, while others are always striving for something different. My theory is, you know, knock your socks off, that's competition. You know, if you wanted to build a ball and call it a world and put yourself inside of it, go for the gusto. This year, Bobby's butterfly entry, carried by friend Danny Lind, continued to push boundaries by questioning the place of the structural frame. Years ago, wire work was just an ugly skeleton. Uh, it was just to hold the material on. I don't agree with that. I think that some of my best work gets hidden, and that's the inner me coming out to show that that's what it's all about. It's a reflection of yourself. Bobby continued the idea with a birdcage frame suit for his son and daughter. Believe it or not, that birdcage was a conceptual idea that came to me bango. And then it grew, what kind of a birdcage. So I went to the library and I researched a little bit and I looked into what it actually was. And then we thought of making Tweety birds. I said, no, no, no. With this type of a suit that you can see through, the birds have to be very colorful and cockatoo or something was different. It's that picture that you're painting in somebody's mind that if you complete the picture, they feel comfortable with it and they say, boy, that looks great. And I love it when somebody takes notice of what I did and how I did it and is it different or not. I guarantee you, you've never seen a birdcage in that parade. It's tomorrow. It's not yesterday. In contrast to Bobby, Palma and John Lucas of Golden Sunrise Club work within a more traditional framework. Using extravagant colors and lavish designs, the costumes and floats they produce aim for beautiful, embellished, fancy display. Palma had never thought about sequin bodysuits until she married longtime mummer John Lucas. But with costume making cluttering the house, she began to help out, decorating back pieces and making simple children's outfits. When John became club captain, he needed more ambitious suits for the captain's float, a yearly tour de force that leads the club up the street. Each year, Palma now creates an impressive group of coordinated costumes for John and his assistants, working from his emerging conception of the float and back pieces. It seems like we've been like together and doing it so long that um, half of the time, like we're almost thinking about the same thing. If there's an idea in his head, he's not going to measure it out. He's not going to put it on paper. He knows what the end product is supposed to look like in his mind, and he just does it. Now, why I'm always rushing like, with a deadline is because I don't really start anything until I see what he's doing. So I f I'm feeding off of him. So the more elaborate the back pieces or the more elaborate the float is that he's making, the more he forces me to be good, to be better, to make one suit better than the other. The idea has to come first. Lots of times it don't work, and you, you have to start all over again. Like, as I'm doing the costume, it might get bigger, it might change, it might have so more and many more colors on it that I thought about in the beginning. I mean, we're not geniuses, we're everyday people. We don't think about it that much, we just do it. To create more elaborate suits, Palma has developed a growing array of technical skills. With no formal training as a seamstress, she often invents her own methods to achieve the decorative effect she wants. The covered ropes, I did that before the ruffles. I had seen a, a costume that was made by a professional costumer, and it had this heavy, heavy look to it. And I, I wanted to do that. And then with the, I figured out maybe I put a rope in there and cover a rope. And I put it in, in the material, a sliver of material, and sewed it on. And then I started to decorate those ropes with sequins and mirrors. Everything is like through the back door, but then it ends up looking like what I wanted. Each thing that I had to work with changes what you're doing. The hot glue gun. I, at first I was scared to death, I didn't want to use it. But then I started to use it and there's so much more um, 
like freedom with it. You don't have to worry about waiting for it to set up. It grabs right away. So I, I like draw with the sequins and the glue gun. Palma points out that fancy costumes are meant to be viewed from a distance. Finished sewing technique is far less important than the need to produce a high visual impact. He'll never get a Botany 500 out of me. I don't have time to do that. I have to sew it so I can get to the decorating and they can get to wear it on the street. Or they'll never get it. They'll never get it. They're lucky they get a fly. Over time, the Lucas's decorative style has helped shape a certain look for the club. Other mummers can often recognize golden sunrise suits by their traditional motifs and richly detailed surfaces. We fill up everything. And a lot of the other um, people that make costumes that we know and a lot of the other clubs would have like a beautiful shape decorated on the outside and it doesn't look finished to us. And lots of people want to know, like, you know, how come? How come they're so gaudy? How come they have all these outrageous colors? I don't know. Probably because it's, it's outdoors, it's in the cold, the, the light shines on it, and it just makes it look different. Everything has to sparkle because it's New Year's. Go around. Over here. I got suits I want to get through. Just slide that over this way a little bit. Oh, it's cool. I'm not, I have not yet begun. Just hold it right there. Come on. Back over here. Danny. Who's that guy? Who cares? Hey, Bees, you ready to get the back pieces on? It all comes together early New Year's morning. In the pre-dawn streets of South Philadelphia, some people have been gearing up for hours. But in the fancy clubs, the mood is tense as members hurry with last-minute details and preparations for the move to Broad Street. One thing that I think that amongst all of us that whether it's traditional or non-traditional, you can look at it and I think we all appreciate the work that goes into it. And you, you know, you look at it and you say, geez, that took like that a lot of time because I know what it takes to make it. It's like nothing else that you've ever done and it's nothing else that somebody else can explain to you. This is a huge worth of work. So now you've got all these little delicate parts that you put together and you're trying to, you know, not break anything. And, you know, aesthetically, how does it look? And how does it look on your back? And is it straight? Because you can't tell. You saw how these fellows were putting their things together. You saw them getting out on Broad Street. You saw them once we started. That was, new. that's the parade. That's what we do it for. And if you win, it's icing on the cake. But you go out there and you see the whole golden sunlight stretched out along Momensing Avenue. And everything is in its place. Everything is going right. Everything is going up the street. We're all brand new. We're beautiful. We're going to Broad Street. We go up there. We're great. We know we're first prize. All four clubs are saying the same thing. And then we go around City Hall. The guys all did a fantastic job. I mean, everybody performed to their best. That made it a perfect New Year's. Thank you. There's winners and losers on New Year's Day. The bottom line is, is that the real mommer will be back next year. No matter what, don't make no difference. It don't make no difference. And then, yeah, you feel great, you feel sad, you cry, you laugh, and that's what it's all about. Thank you.